Okay, I want to welcome you all today. This is another one of the, the discussions that I guess I consider it science in the pottery series. We've had a couple other talks that talked about chemistry and other aspects, how science interact with or, or are a part of pottery. So this is pottery and physics today. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. And I also, I sent out a word to some teachers in the area. I don't know whether they were able to make it or not, but um, about, I thought this might be interesting to people who are interested in the schools in, in STEAM projects, because this is sort of appropriate for that to sort of show the connection between how does, how does science figure into other, other fields like art? What's the connection? Okay, well physics is basically the science of energy and matter and how they interact, how, they, how matter and energy interact. And it involves, the actual scientific work involves things like the measurement of physical properties, like the measuring the speed of light or determining physical laws. Um, uh, like right now, I mean, a big part of like astrophysics is people are looking into like, you know, black, black, black matter and this sort of thing, dark energy. Um, but when you think of physics, you probably think of things like rocket science and astrophysics and atomic energy. But the point is that physics and the laws of physics are intimately involved in things we do every single day and even in something as humble as our pottery activities. Um, and so we're going to talk about that. We'll talk about, um, about how the physics is involved and what's going on sort of behind the scenes when we're doing something. What, what's the physics that's controlling what we're doing? And the point is, there's a lot going on behind what we see when we're doing something. And this is true of chemistry and other aspects of science. But physics and chemistry are really very active in ceramics, in pottery. And you might say, well, you know, what, in a, in a general sense, what use is the information? Well, in a broad sense, I mean, I personally, I just enjoy seeing these connections. I love seeing connections between different areas of knowledge. So I like the idea of the fact that just to help, just to understand, to see what's going on. Um, it also helps, I think you'll see when we get into the talk, it really does help to understand why things work the way they do. And how do we, if we have a problem, how do we address it? If we understand what's actually going on and not just the sort of on, what's on the surface, we can address the problems. Um, and, and along with that, and ultimately also, I guess I should say that all of this work that, I, that we do with trying to connect science with pottery. To me, the real goal is to solve problems so you can get to doing the art. If you're tripping over technical problems, like the clay is cracking and your kiln is blowing up and the glaze is running and the pots are falling apart, you never get to do the creative aesthetic work. So the whole point of all of this is to, is to make the, the mechanics or the process of making pottery easy and almost routine so that you can spend your time doing the creative pro part and not struggling with some of these technical problems. To me, that's, that's the value in knowing a lot of the scientific part, is solving problems so you can get to what, the reason why you're doing art. So, so what I thought I'd do is, as, a, as, a, as a, an approach to this is, we'll just talk through all the different, the typical steps that you do when you're making pottery, like you're working with the clay and then you shape it and then you bisque fire it and you dry it and so forth. And then at each step, we'll talk about what's actually going on and what's happening at each step, or what are the physical laws that are coming in to each step. And first of all, just a little background in terms of terminology. When we're, when we're working in, our sort of, in this sort of physical realm where we're, we're making things, there are three kinds of forces that we can apply to something. Three, way, three, 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 uh, three different ways of, of applying a force. And that's tension, compression, and shear. And so a tension force is basically pulling or stretching. When I take a rubber band and I stretch it, I'm applying, that's a tensile force, T-E-N-S-I-L-E, or I'm creating tension in the rubber band. I'm stretching it. Then there's compression, where that's basically mashing it together or compacting something. So like, if you have a garbage compactor at home, that garbage compactor applies compression to the garbage and squashes it together and makes it denser and tight, more tightly packed. That's compression. And then there's another force called shear, which is basically sliding or smearing. And the other thing to keep in mind is that even in the natural world, if, if something changes when something happens in the physical world, it's because there's been a change in the balance of forces. So the reason why we can sit here on this floor and, not, and just sit here perfectly still is because the pull of gravity on our body is balanced by the force that's pushing up from the floor on the ground. 
And if the force on the ground wasn't pushing up enough, we'd sink into the earth. So the reason why we can sit here and nothing changes is because the forces are balanced. If the forces weren't balanced, something would change. And so when you see a change even in the natural world or in pottery, it's because something is no longer in balance. Okay, so let's talk about the steps in pottery. We'll start with just something really simple like wedging clay. Okay, you're wedging clay and we're doing it because we want to mix the clay and maybe we want to compress the clay but, and we're trying to get some of the air out of it. Well, what's, what's happening? Well, we are, we, are, we are applying compression to the clay. That's one of the, one of the forces. We're, we're pushing on the clay. So we're, excuse me, we're packing the clay particles together. If there are gaps in the clay, we're compressing those together. We're also doing a lot of shear because when we're, when we're, when we're rolling out the clay or smearing it a little bit, we're shearing the clay. And the point is like, so what? Well, the reason why is because with clay, because we know clay particles are shaped like these little platelets, they're not little round balls. When we're compressing or shearing the clay, we're aligning the clay particles. So when we're wedging it, regardless of what, that may not be what we have in mind when we're wedging it, we're just mixing it up, or maybe we think the clay has gotten a little stiff and so we want to loosen it up. But in fact, what we're doing is we're aligning or changing the alignment of the clay particles because of the compression and the shear. And I'll show you, let me show you an example here. If I have, a, if I have just a chunk of clay, and this is just sort of schematically showing, these are the little clay particles kind of randomly oriented in this lump of clay. I've sort of sliced it in half, and I'm making a big enough. And if I, if I push on it with compression, I change the orientation. Not only does the little lump of clay get a little lower, but I change the orientation to look like that. Because when they're like this and I push on them, they tend to get oriented opposite or perpendicular to the direction that I push on them. So when I'm wedging it, the minute I push down, I'm moving these clay particles around. The same way, if I, ha if I take that same lump of clay that's random particles and I shear it, I smear it, I do the same thing. I've changed the shape of the lump of clay, but I've also oriented the clay particles like that. Do the clay particles ever go back to their random? Not by themselves. Not by themselves. And generally, I'd say the answer is no. The more you, every time, if I have a lump of clay and I just touch it with my finger, right under where I've touched it with my finger, I've changed the orientation of the clay particles. And, we, and, and you might say, well, why do we care about that? What does it matter? Because the properties of clay are different in the different directions. So when I have, if I, if I imagine this is a little clay particle, it shrinks when it's fired and when it dries more in that direction than it does in that direction. They don't, behave, they don't behave the same in all directions. So when the particles are oriented in one direction versus the other, the shrinkage is different and the, and in both the drying and the firing. So this is one of the reasons, this is one of the major causes of drying cracks and a lot of other problems is differences in orientation. If the particles in one part of a pot are oriented differently than those in another part of a pot, that means the shrinkages between those two parts are different. Well, if the shrinkage is, enough, is different enough, you get cracks. And a classic example of that, I don't think this is a little bit off, but this, this, this is a good example of the sort of why this matters. And a classic example is because if I throw a cup on the wheel, this is a nice lightweight cup, okay? And, but when I throw, it also is a good doorstop or a bookend. Um, but if I throw this on the wheel, and, and we'll talk about this later, actually, that's an, actually, you know, let's, I'm gonna slide, this is wheel throwing the next step. When I throw it on the wheel and I'm putting pressure on the inside and the outside of the pot with my fingers, I align the clay particles like that in the walls because I'm putting compression on the walls with my fingers when I'm throwing. So I align the clay part and when I push down on the bottom, you know they always say you're supposed to compress the clay in the bottom, then I align the bottom of the pot like that, okay? Now I, th now I roll out a handle. I take a handle and I pull it or I, 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 I pull a handle. So I'm putting tension on the handle, right? I'm stretching the handle. When I do that, I line the clay particles like that in, the, in this piece of hand. Now I apply the clay, the handle to the mug and the particles are oriented like that. I've got the worst possible situation in the world right there because I've got particles in the handle. Here's a blow up. I've got particles in the handle oriented like that and particles in the wall in, the, in exactly opposite directions. This wants to shrink a lot this way. This wants to shrink a lot this way. It's no wonder the handles crack and fall off. Picking up a little bit more in wheel throwing. So when we're throwing the clay on the wheel, 
We're, we're putting compression on the clay from between our inside and our outside fingers. We're also creating an awful lot of shear on the clay because the clay is sliding through our fingers and when it's being pulled through our fingers, there's drag. Our fingers are dragging on the clay. Well, that drag, that's a shear force. That, that's a, that's, it's, it's tending to smear the clay. So between the pressure and the drag of our fingers on the clay, we're orienting the clay particles in the walls. And we may, that may be not what we're trying to do consciously, but that's what's happening. We're just trying to get the wall, raise the walls up. We're trying to lift it against the force of gravity, and we're trying to raise it up. But what's actually happening, what's even more important, is the fact that we're aligning the clay particles because of that compression in the shear. And the other thing, they, the, and, it's, and there are two sides of that. By aligning the clay particles like that, like I did in, in the walls of the pot or in the handle, we're actually strengthening the clay. So we're opening ourselves up to possible problems when we join clay because now we've got an orientation going on that if we join it in opposite directions, it's a potential shrinkage problem. But at the same time, in, in overall, we're strengthening the clay by aligning the clay particles. The clay is stronger to have all the little particles aligned than to just have them randomly arranged. Okay, so let, let's say instead of, instead of throwing on the wheel, we're hand building and we're rolling out we're, we're going to roll out some slabs or roll out some coils. Well, again, if, I'm, if I've got a lump of clay on a, on a board and I'm going to put a rolling pin on it, compression and shear. I'm pushing down on it. I'm compressing the clay. So I'm rolling. I'm, I'm aligning the clay. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, and I'm, and I'm also introducing some shear because I'm smearing the clay particles. And again, the importance of that is because it affects the properties. That's really, what's, what, that's really why that orientation is important. The other thing that's going on, though, with, with rolling out a slab, for example, is at the edges of the slab, I'm getting tension. I may think, even though I'm pushing on the slab, because if you think about it, if I make a, you know, when you've rolled out a slab, and you, when you get to the edge, you can see how the slab kind of grows, and it, if I'm making it thinner by, by rolling it out, the slab kind of gets bigger because I'm making it thinner, and the edges kind of do this. Well, this is tension. This is the reason why you don't want to use the edge of a rolled slab. At least, I'd say, I usually say an inch, and depending on the clay, sometimes two inches you want to stay away from the edge of the slab. Because in fact, in order for the slab to expand, you're actually creating tension on the edges of the slab. That's, that you can, if you get enough compression on the edge to solve that, you've made the slab too thin. So when you're rolling out a slab a quarter of an inch or whatever you're rolling out, when you get to the edges, it's the, sla the slab is actually sort of tearing, if you want to think about it. You can't see it. But the, because, the, because the slab is doing this as it expands, this is tension. The part of, so it, it, makes, it actually is weak. So that's the reason why you want to avoid, when you're making part, if you're cutting parts out of a slab, stay away from the very edge of the slab. You can't avoid that. You can't avoid the, the tension on the edge. And the problem is, it's like little tiny cracks that you can't see, and then they show up when you build something out of it. And you may, you may have cut a piece out of the edge and you've completely lost track of even where it came from in the slab. And now you've, you've constructed something from pieces of the slab and a crack shows up. And very often the crack doesn't show up until you do the high firing at the end. So it may not show up during the drying, it may not show up during the bisque, it may, but it probably will show up at the very end of the, during the glaze firing. And you've lost the continuity of, well, where did this piece come from in the slab? Forget it. But that's the cause. That's, very often that's the cause. You used an edge piece from the slab. So there's a, there's a case where I've got, even though I'm applying compression and shear, I create tension on the edges. And that, and that can lead to cracking. So now we've made, we've talked about a little bit by throwing and hand building. So now, now you come to the drying stage of making pottery. What, what happens? Well, basically, all we care about is the water is removed and the clay shrinks. That's all we really, that's what we see. The water, the clay gets dry. Well, what's actually happening is, First of all, the water, when we have the wet clay, the water is evaporating from the surface of the clay. But then there's a, there's a, a, a phenomenon called, you probably heard of capillary action. By, it's the, the capillary action of, this is physics, the capillary action is moving the water from inside the clay to the surface. And that's because if I put water, and you, you probably see, if I put this water, this is let's say a glass tube, and I put water in the glass tube, the water wants to rise up. The water is actually attract. The, the water molecules are actually attracted to the glass molecules, and they actually climb up the side a little bit. It's not enough in the center to hold to support the water up, but right where the water is in contact with the glass, the water molecules are so attracted to the glass they actually climb up the walls. 
And if the tube is narrow enough that there isn't a big part in the middle, the capillary action can actually pull the water up the tube. If the walls aren't too far apart, this pull, this area where, where it's, the water is pulling, is attracted to the glass, can actually pull the water right up the tube. That's called capillary action. And, that's, and the capillary is just basically a very small tube, like the capillaries in our blood capillaries are tiny little tubes in our body. And so this is what's actually happening in the clay. The tiny little spaces between the clay particles, the, clay, the water actually climbs up through those, through those space, those little capillaries or those little spaces and moves to, that's why the water moves to the surface of the clay. So as the water is evaporating from the surface of the clay, the capillary action is bringing the clay from in, the water from the clay inside to the surface to continue to be evaporated. But what's also happening here is that there's another physical property here called surface tension. And this is the attraction of water to itself. You know, like you've seen water, like if you put a droplet of water on a, on a clean surface, the water, the water doesn't necessarily do that, it does that. It makes a little bead. That's surface tension. That's where the water molecules are more attracted to themselves than to the, than to the surface they're on. So instead of being attracted and spreading out on the surface, they pull into themselves. This is the same thing that happens with a glaze when the glaze crawls. You've seen crawling glazes where the glaze beads up because the, the liquid glaze is attracted to itself. That's the surface tension of the liquid glaze. Well, in this case, the, the surface tension, the, 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 the water likes the clay. So it will do this, but then when the clay, when the water is removed, the, the, the attraction of the water to the clay pulls the, the remaining clay particles together, which is why the clay shrinks. That's why the clay shrinks when it dries, because you remove some water and the remaining water pulls the, it's attracted to itself and to the other clay part, and it pulls the remaining clay particles together. So it's the surface tension of the water that's in the clay that makes the clay shrink while it's drying. So that's why you want to dry it slowly. You want to dry it slowly because you want to give enough time for the water to move to the surface. And it doesn't come in real quick. And, and also, and especially, so that one part doesn't come in quicker than another, which is the really key thing. Because if one part shrinks more than another, what happens is if one part is moving or shrinking more than another, what, you're going to get a crack between those two parts. If one part isn't moving and another part is moving, that can't, that, that can't, have, that's a physical impossibility, so you're going to get a crack. Is that praising? No, that, no, that's for a glaze. This is just the, oh, you mean what I was just referring to? No, that would just be like a drying crack. Oh, okay. Yeah, and the classic thing that you see, that's, that's a classic example. You'll see, you know, you've heard about S cracks yeah. on the bottom of a pot, and you look at the pot, and you get a crack that looks like that on the bottom. That's a drying crack, and that's because, here's the pot. That's because when it was, and, and here it is, and this is, this is the extra clay that has to be trimmed off. So when, after the pot was thrown, after the pot was thrown, this part of the, cl the clay that sticks up out of the air tends to dry out really quickly because it's exposed to the air. So this part, the upper walls, they dry really quickly. Okay, but, and, I, and I'm, you know, I'm, normally I'm waiting for it to dry a little bit so that I can turn it over and trim it. I'm waiting for it to stiffen up. So this part's getting dry. This part down here is not doing a lot of drying because it's thicker and it's stuck, down, it's stuck down close to the bat. Now I turn it over and I go to trim it. And so I got it upside down now. And I've got this extra clay here. This part has already dried and I trim this and now this part wants to shrink. Well, it can't shrink much because this part is already rigid. This is kind of a, think of it as like a drum and a drum head. The frame of the drum, the, the circular thing, this part has already dried and it's pretty rigid or it's stiffer. It's not going to shrink much more. This part is still kind of soft and it wants to shrink and it wants to pull in. Well, it can't pull the sides in with it because they're already kind of stiff. So all it can do is tear. And that's what the S-crack is. It's like when you, if you slit or if you've ever seen a drum, somebody beats on a drum and they split the drum head and it, because it's under tension and, it, and it, they split it and it tears. That's what happens here. The bottom tears because the bottom part that they've trimmed wants to pull in, and, but in order to pull in, it would have to pull the sides in with it. Well, it can't pull the sides in with it because they've already gotten a little stiffer. So at some point, if the bottom is thin and the sides are stiff, all the bottom can do is tear. It's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna stop shrinking when it dries. It's going to shrink. But if it can't pull the sides in with it, 
then all it can do is tear away from the sides. And usually what it does is that. It usually tears in the middle because it stays attached to the sides and it tears in the middle. Now, if this was a hand-built pot, the only reason why that's an S is because it's thrown on the wheel. If this was a slab-built pot, the exact same thing would happen and you'd just get that. You'd just get a straight crack. So I'm rolling out, uh, with hand building, I'm rolling out slabs and I'm getting compression and shear and aligning the clay particles, but I'm getting, so now we're talking, now, and we're getting tearing at the edges. Now I'm drying the pots. So the surface tension is pulling the particles together. So I've got, the capillary action is drawing the water to the surface to allow the piece to dry. And the, cap and the, the surface tension of the water is pulling the particles together, which is why they shrink. And finally, when there isn't that much water left in the drying clay, then the and, the, and the, and the clay particles have finally gotten to the point where they've kind of collided, there isn't much water between them, then the shrinkage stops. Doesn't mean the pot is completely dry, but the shrinkage stops because there isn't enough water to pull them, the strength of the water isn't that much, and the particles have already kind of collided where they can't get any closer together. So all I do at that point is the rest of the water that's stuck in these little holes leaves but the, the, the shrinkage stops, okay? So those are the two forces in drying, the capillary action and the surface tension, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, so next stage is bisque firing. So I go into bisque firing, let's say in an electric kiln, and well, the first thing that happens when I turn the kiln on is the elements get hot. That's called resistance heating. This is another physical principle, is the fact that when I turn on, the, the, the elements get hot because I'm passing electrons through the metal, that's the electrical current, and they're co colliding with the atoms in the, in the metal. And if they can't go straight through it, by, they collide and they tend to jiggle around and go, move randomly, that generates heat. This is, a, this is a physical process called resistance heating. And so that's why the elements got hot even. There's something going on inside the elements to make the elements in the electric kiln get hot. Resistance heating. So then, then, so then the elements get hot and then the pots start getting hot. Well, there are three, again, another physical principle, there are three mechanisms of heat transfer. The three main mechanisms of heat transfer, how does the heat get from the elements to the pots? Um, and these are physical things. Well, one is convection, which is basically moving air currents. So the air, the warm air, as you know, warm air rises, so the warm air in the kiln rises and transfers some of the heat to the pots. Then you get radiation, which is actually the heat waves coming, from, you know, when you feel, when you hold your hand near something and you can feel the warmth like a radiator, that's actually radiation. That's, that's infrared rays, or infrared waves that, that, that are being emitted. That's why the sun feels hot on you and the sunshine, that's radiation. That's infrared waves that are hitting your skin and, and making your skin hot and you feel them. So that's the same thing the elements do. They don't have to touch the, they don't have to touch the pots. They radiate the heat out, touch them. And then there's also conduction within the pots Conduction is heat moving through a solid or through a material. So if you think about it, if I have pots sitting in an electric kiln, the, the side that faces the elements gets hot first, right? So how does the side that doesn't face the element get hot? Well, some of that is because the heat moves through the pot. The heat moves by conduction from the hot side of the pot to the cold side of the pot. So you've got all three things happening in the kiln. You've got convection, air moving around, you've got radiation from the elements, and you've got conduction within the pots themselves. Okay, well then another thing that happens during the bisque firing is when the pots get hot enough, the chemical water is removed, the water crystal. That's another physical change. The water is changing basically from a liquid, or in this case, an ion in the material, to a, to a gas. And then finally, as a result of the bisque, the clay usually gets stronger. We notice that the clay is stronger as a result of the bisque firing. This is another physical process. This is a process called sintering, S-I-N-T-E-R-I-N-G. Sintering. And this is where the, what's happened is the little clay particles have actually bonded together. They've bonded together enough so that they're, in a sense, you can think of them as sort of glued together. They're not, they're, you know, the, and as you're well aware that at, during a bisque firing or after a bisque firing, the clay is still very porous. So the clay particles haven't gotten mashed together completely. They're just, where they're touching, they've kind of stuck together. They've gotten bonded together. That's, the process is called sintering. And this actually happens because atoms, during the, during the heating, atoms actually move around and they go to the points where the, they move to the points where the little clay particles are, are touching and fill in the spaces there a little bit. 
And so the clay has actually gotten, gotten stronger and harder as a result of the, of the, of the, uh, the bisque firing. Okay, so now we're going to do, now we're going on in our step, now we're going to prepare some glazes. So we're getting ready, we've got, we've bisque fired the pots and we're up to glaze preparation. So we take the dry, the dry ingredients and we mix them with water. That's what, we, that's what we're doing. But one of the, one of the best ways to, to mix a glaze is by what's called high shear mixing. And we talked about what shear is, is that if you, there are, you can buy these mixing blades that you can attach to a drill or they, or like, you know what, a good example, you know the old, the old, um, machine they used to have like in soda fountains where you'd make a milkshake and it like or like a blender that's a high a blender is a high shear mixer and what it means is you have a blade in the in the in the material that causes shear on the particles it, it hits them and moves past them so fast that it rips them apart it shears the particles apart and so if you have lumps in the glaze when you use one of these mixers it shears them and rips them apart it's a really effective way to break up sticky gooey lumps because you can't cut them they're kind of you know you can't tear them so a high shear mixer is a really effective way to make, make a glaze and when, you know, and, and another sort of common way you hear this term is, you know, sizz, you talk about just something like scissors for cutting things. You know, the other name for scissors is shears. That's because when you're actually cutting a piece of paper with a pair of scissors, you're shearing the paper. You're doing this. The same way I had that picture where you're pushing in opposite directions. When, we, when we're doing this, I was showing before shear, that's what we're doing with, when we're moving those two blades past each other with the scissors, we're shearing the paper. So it's a very effective way of ripping things apart. So a high shear mixing blade is a very effective way. This, this, this fast moving blade rips these little lumps and things apart and, and it rips air bubbles apart. It's a great way of mixing the glaze. Do you recommend using a blender? Uh, a blender is, is overkill. You can use, a, you know what I use, the, you know one of those little immersion blenders, you know the little handheld things? That's great for like test glazes. Those are great for, me. if you have a small quantity of glaze, um, that's a great thing for, for mixing up. You're just going to go bzz, just a couple of seconds and you've mixed your glaze. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. But I, I, I really recommend, I like the kind where you get, you get this, it's like on a drill rod and you can stick it into an electric drill. We use those, those here all the time for mixing up the glaze and it's really effective. And you can, some of these glazes and some of the ingredients in the glazes, you just can't break up the lumps by stirring. You just, you'll never break them up, especially like bentonite. If you get bentonite lumps, you're never going to break them up by stirring. Whereas the high shear mixer will just re literally rip them apart. Really effective. It's worth it. Can that substitute for screening the glaze? No, because the screening is to remove like, it, it'll help, but like you might have like hard chunks of stuff. Like, like for instance, when, you, like, you know, when you're making up a glaze and you're buying natural minerals, they're not, these are not made for pharmaceutical purposes. So for instance, in the factory, there might be a hole in the screen. So there could very well be coarser chunks in the same powder. And I've seen that happen a lot. And the, the, the high shear mixer can't tear those. Like if you have chunks of feldspar, chunks of quartz in your silica, it can't rip. So the screening gets rid of those. But it's great for soft lumps. It's great. And for also just mixing it in general. So now we're, um, oh, so we, we're mixing up. The, so what else do we do when we, when we test the glaze? Well, you might want to adjust the flow or the fluidity of the glaze. Like is it thick and, or you know, how much water do you put in it? This is another whole area of physics called rheology. And it's the study of the flow of liquids or the flow of fluids. And that means like the viscosity. Does everybody know what the definition of viscosity is? The resistance to flow of a liquid. So this includes things like viscosity, like how thick or fluid, how runny is the sample. So we care about that because we, don't want, our, we want our liquid glaze to be nice and fluid. We don't want it to be too th stiff. This also brings into these other properties that we've talked about before. Remember thixotropy and dilatancy? Like, have you seen glazes where 
after they sit for a while and it's like almost like again like jello and then as you stir it it gets easier and easier to stir and the more you stir it then finally it looks pretty pretty good that's that's a thixotropic glaze well that's another real logical property is that's something that changes the the the, the apparent viscosity or the thickness changes with stirring the latency is the opposite the more you try to stir it and the harder you try to stir it the harder it the more it resists and it gets like stiffer you know, just to, not to get off, too off the track here, but a good example of dye latency is, have you ever, the stuff that settles out to the bottom of a glaze, the sludge, and it's almost impossible, you can't even get a stick into it, that's, that, that stuff that has settled out to the bottom is dilatant. And the only way to stir it up is you can't, the, the harder and faster you poke at it, the more it resists, is very slowly, like slow your whole body down and, and slowly stir it and you can get it to move. And if the, 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 you do it fast, you're never gonna get it to move. It's the same idea of an, a practical example is if you've ever walked along the shoreline of a body of water, just where the water is lapping up on the sand, let's say, have you ever noticed that you, if you stomp on the sand real fast there, it, it resists your feet, but if you stand there, you can wiggle your toes and sink into the stand. That's why anybody that runs on the beach, professional runners that practice running on the beach, they run in that part of the water. That's why they do it, because the sand there is dilatant. It means that if you hit it fast, it, it, it almost like freezes and resists the motion, but if you stand there and you move slowly, you can sink and wiggle your toes, you can sink right down into it. So when they're running along the beach, they don't want to run on the loose sand. That would be too hard to run on. It's too exhausting. They don't want to run in the water. So you run right where the water is lapping up on the shore, and it's almost like running on concrete, but it gives you a little bit of a cushion. That's why it's actually a very good place to run. But that's, that, that sand there is dilatant. So if you try to move it quickly, it doesn't move at all. If you move it slowly, it'll kind of move, which is the same as that sludge in the bottom of the glaze. So anyway, so you're making up the glaze. So another thing that can happen when you're making up the glaze is the, sol the solid particles can settle out. Some glazes, especially depending on what they contain, while you're making it up, the stuff is settling to the bottom. And basically just what's going on there is a battle between gravity and the drag, for and drag forces. In other words, the little particles that are, that are, that are the gravity is pulling the, the particles down through the glaze, but the little particles are being pulled on by the water molecules and the other things that's in their way. It's called drag. And so the reason why they, they settle is because the force of gravity is stronger than the drag forces, the pull to keep them up. If the, if the clay particles are small, or not part, part clay, but if any of the particles in the glaze are small enough so that the drag forces, the forces exerted by the friction of the other particles is greater than gravity, they never settle out. So that's why some particles settle out and some don't. Because if there's enough, if enough resistance from the other surrounding particles for a little particle to move through them and it can't move through them and the pull of gravity isn't strong enough, it'll just stay in suspension. Okay, so again, it's, it, that's a balance between those two forces. So now, now we go to glaze application. So I've made up a glaze and I want to apply the, and I, I apply the glaze to the surface of the pot. I dip it on the, I dip the pot in it or I pour the glaze on it. Well now in this case, it's the capillary action of the water that pulls the water into the pot and leaves the, the minerals or the glaze on the surface. When the, when the, glaze, when the wet glaze hits, the, hits the, the bisque ware, those same little spaces, the water is attracted to the clay and the, water, the, and the capillary action now pulls the water from the glaze into the clay. Well, the particles, the solid particles that are in the clay can't fit through those little spaces in the clay. So they get filtered out. They end up staying on the surface while the capillary action pulls the water into the pot. So you end up with a deposit of all the solids on the surface and the water has moved into the, into the bisque ware, which is perfect because now the, most of the glaze particles, they're, they're way too coarse compared to the little tiny holes or openings in the clay. So they get like a filter. They get filtered out on, and they stay on the surface and the water continues to move in and you end up with the, the bisque ware is damp and you end up with this layer of the damp solids on the surface, the, your, your, clay, your glaze. And then you dry it out and the water moves back out by capillary action, just like when the clay was drying and it moves out, it moves through the clay and it moves through the powdered layer and just evaporates. Okay, glaze firing. So I've, I've got a dried glaze. Well, okay, so let's say in an electric kiln, once again, what happens is the elements get hot. We already talked about that, resistance heating. In a gas kiln, let's say, I'm gonna do my glaze firing. The burners produce heat. Well, in this case, the burning is actually a chemical reaction, 
but there's still some physical things going on. For one thing, in a gas kiln or in any kiln where I'm burning something, I want to, I want to mix the air and the, and the gas or the air and the fuel. And so I want turbulence. And this is another, there's another whole area of physics that deals with fluid, and this is part of reality, deals with fluid flow and fluid dynamics, it's called. And so what I really want is I want what's called turbulent flow. I want turbulence. I want, I want the, the gas and the air to mix all together by themselves, a lot of just turbulence, and it, and it creates mixing. I don't want the, the air and the gas just moving through sort of placidly and not mixing because I wouldn't get efficient burning. So I'm take, I, I, I design a burner, for example, to create turbulence to help mix the gas in the air. So I'm taking advantage of a physical principle to get efficient burning in the burner. The burning itself is a chemical reaction, but the way I mix the fuel in the air is a physical process. And so I depend on a well-designed burner to help do that, to help mix the gas in the air. And there's also, there are certain kinds of gas burners called atmospheric burners, and they take care, they take a, they, they use another physical principle called Bernoulli's principle, and that is the burner itself actually draws in air. If I create, you, you probably all heard the, the horribly misused term of Venturi. Have you all heard of that? If I create a, if I, if I create a burner that has a neck in it like that, this is a gas burner, and the gas comes in here and moves out like that, and here's my flame, when the gas moves through this, this narrower part of the burner, it actually creates a, a little bit of a suction and it draws in air. This is the physical principle, it's called Bernoulli's principle. When I speed up the gas flow, the pressure drops and it actually draws in air. So this is a great kind of burner because instead of just having gas and air coming in around it, it actually pulls in air and mixes the air with the gas in the burner. That's kind of the ideal situation. It's doing the mixing for me. No electricity, I don't need any electricity or anything. I just need to pass the gas through the burner and the, the burner itself draws in the air. And we, we use those burners all the time. They're called atmospheric or venturi burners. And this, this narrowing of this neck is, is, is a venturi. That's what that's called. So we're taking advantage of that principle to actually, again, get even more efficient burning and more efficient mixing of the gas. Not all burners do this, but this particular kind with this neck in it. Does. Matter of fact, I can bring in, I've got one outside. I can bring it in afterward and show it to you. And you know what this is? This is the exact same principle if you ever had a car. I mean, this was a long time ago. That had a carburetor. This is the way a carburetor worked on a car. Only the carburetor, they just turned it 90 degrees and you had a thing that looked like this. And when your engine drew in air down through this horn sort of of the intake of the carburetor, there was a little hole in the side. And when the, when the, when the air drew in air, it sucked in the gas from the side. That's the way your carburetor worked. It wasn't pumped in like with an injector like we have now. It just was drawn in. When the, engine, when the engine sucked in the air, it created this, this, this venturi, this neck, created a suction and it sucked in the gas. Okay, so now uh, I've got the gas burners. The pots are gonna get hot by the same three mechanisms we talked about, mechanisms of heat transfer, so that's gonna happen again. Now also what's gonna happen is the kiln is getting hot, but it's also gonna lose heat. So when every time, whenever you fire a kiln, it's a race. You're pumping in heat and the kiln is losing heat and you're trying to pump in heat faster than the kiln is losing heat. Well, the kiln is losing heat by those same mechanisms, heat transfer. Conduction through, heat is being conducted through the walls of the kiln and then being radiated off the outside of the kiln and lost, to the, which is why when you stand around a kiln that's running, it feels warm because the heat is being conducted through the walls, through the brick, and then radiated from the outside into the air. So the kiln is losing heat. And then finally, what, when you went on the pots, the pots again are getting denser and stronger as a result of the firing. And this is a continuation of the same process as in the bis fire. You're getting sintering, the pots are shrinking, you're also getting some partial melting, but it's a continuation, because you're at a higher temperature, of the same thing that was happening in the bis firing. The pots are getting denser and harder. Um, also, during the glaze firing, the glazes may flow and move, right? The glazes might, they don't just sit there and melt, they may, they may flow, they may move. So we're concerned about things like how runny or how fluid does the glaze get when it melts? So now we're back to fluid properties again. We're even, it happens to be a melted glaze, it's not water, but the same principles apply, is how runny 
We talked about like viscosity. So what's the viscosity of the melted glaze? Well, we don't want it to be, we don't want it to be too high because we want the glaze, ideally when, you, when a glaze melts, we want it to flow out a little bit, right? And sort of heal imperfections. And so that we want to end up with a nice smooth surface so that even if our glaze application wasn't perfect, when it's fired, we've sort of healed some of those little defects. So we don't want the glaze to be too viscous, too thick when it melts, because it won't flow enough, but we don't want it to be too runny, because it'll just run right off the pot. So this is something we think about, we care about, is what's, what's the glaze like when it's melt? What's the viscosity of the glaze when it melts? Is it runny or is it really thick? For instance, like chinos are really, really thick. This is why chinos typically, everybody familiar with what a chino glaze is? and how very often they have crawl spots and, they, and they, don't look, they don't have a regular surface. Because of the composition of the glaze, they are really, really viscous when they melt. They don't flow out. That's a good thing because you can never get a glaze, you can never get a chino to run. They don't run. It's almost impossible to make them run. But on the other hand, they don't flow out in even all the little defects and when they crawl, they don't heal because it's so viscous, they don't flow out. Whereas other glazes might be you know, very runny and you get a nice, like lead glazes, for example, you get beautiful fluid surfaces, but if you overfire them, they run. So we care about, this is a case where we care about the viscosity of this, of this, this liquid, the melted glaze. Ash glazes are, are another unusual characteristic. This is where we, we take advantage of this. You know, ash glazes form those typical rivulet patterns, they call them, like little streams and rivers. And that's because we've created in an ash glaze a very special balance between the surface tension and the viscosity. We've, we've made a, a, a run, the, the ash glazes are runny, but they've also have a high surface tension, meaning that the, the liquid wants to pull itself into itself, which is why it pulls itself into streams and then the streams flow. So the high surface tension makes the glaze attract to itself and want to stick together, but the fact that it's runny makes it flow. So instead of getting sheets of glaze, we get streams of glaze. And we take advantage of the, of the balance between those two properties, the surface tension and the viscosity, to create the effect that we like in ash glazes. Um, cooling, okay, so the glaze is cooling. Um, things are, ha the, 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 heat, the heat's being lost from the kiln. There may be crystals growing in the glaze while the glaze is still liquid. That's a, basically a physical process. Atoms moving around and crystals are growing. Then the liquid glaze freezes, another physical process. So I had a liquid and now it freezes and becomes a solid, solid glass. Um, and now another property comes into effect, the coefficient of thermal expansion. Have you all heard of that before? And what the coefficient of thermal expansion, this is another physical property. I'm not going to write it out. It's just this coefficient of thermal expansion. By the way, if pe people that, that work with glass more commonly refer to it as this, the coefficient of expansion. Those are the same. That's the same term, COE or CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion or coefficient of expansion. And what it really means is it's, it's not just expansion. It's expansion and contraction. And all it means is take anything, any piece of something, and if you heat it up, it expands and you cool it down and it contracts. And usually it contracts back to where you started. It doesn't change size. You, know, you heat it up and you cool it back down. It's not bigger or smaller usually unless something else has occurred. So for instance, if I take a, a piece of metal, piece of wood, piece of plastic, piece of, any, piece of human body, if I heat it up, it'll expand a little bit. And as I cool it back down, it contracts back down. But the thing is, every single, just about every single thing having a different composition expands and contracts differently. You change the composition, it changes the amount that it expands when you heat it and the amount that when you contract it, when you cool it. We take advantage of this, for instance, if you ever have a jar of spaghetti sauce and you can't get the lid off, you know, so you hold it under warm water and all of a sudden the lid is loose, because the metal lid has a higher coefficient of thermal expansion than the glass jar. So that when I heat it up, it means the lid expands more than the jar expands, so the lid gets loose, so I can open the lid. So when I'm opening the spaghetti sauce, I'm taking advantage of a difference in coefficients of a thermal expansion of the two materials. <laughs> okay? Uh, so this comes into play now when my, my glazed pots are cooling down because I've got two different materials there in, in a pot. I've got the clay and I've got the glaze. And they're not going to, chances are they're not going to contract at the same rate. 
And the extremes, the extremes that occur are if the glaze contracts a lot more than the clay, what happens? What glaze defect is created? Crazing. If the glaze contracts more than the clay, I get, I get crazing. And if the clay contracts more, a lot more than the glaze, what do I get? Shivering. This is where the, clay, the glaze actually flies off the pot. And so, the, and that, so that, and that goes right, that's, that's, that's the result of this physical property or the difference in, the, in this physical property between the two materials, between the clay and the glaze. So we, this is something we care a lot about. Um, one, f and one final note on, gla on the glaze fire. We're going to talk about the properties of the fired ceramics in a minute. But one final property is you might also, one of the things you might do, and some people, especially with gas kilns and wood kilns, people talk about they want to figure out the efficiency of the kiln. People are always saying, you know, this kiln design is more efficient than another. Well, basically, when you're talking about the efficiency of the kiln, what you're talk really talking about is the balance between how much, how, much heat, how much good the heat is doing and how much is wasted. And so this brings in all those things we were talking about, about in terms of how easily is the heat lost from the kiln, how, how, easy, how, how good is the insulation on the kiln, how easily is it radiated from the outside. That all enters into calculating the, I'm not going to go into a lot, but, that, but all these things we talked about come back in terms of, or, or come into determining the efficiency of the kiln, including the kiln, even, even something basic in terms of the kiln design, the surface area versus the volume of the kiln. The more outside surface there is on the kiln compared to the volume, the less efficient the kiln is because it's going to radiate a lot of heat. So this is why small kilns are generally not very efficient. Big kilns are inherently of the same design. Big kilns are inherently more efficient because there's more space compared to the surface area. And there's less area to be, for heat to be radiated. So even something that fundamental in terms of the physical properties has an effect. All other things being the same. Okay, properties of fired ceramics. And this is something, this is a major property of ceramics that we're going to talk about, the strength. And this, they, we, we run into this a lot. I'm talking about the fired ceramic now. As you're probably aware, ceramics under ordinary use, they don't bend like metals and plastics. Okay, they're generally considered to be brittle materials. And glass, glass is a ceramic, so glass falls under the same thing, basically. It's a brittle material. And the problem is, with brittle materials is, in general, they're very strong in compression and very weak in tension. We know what the, we talked about those two materials. The reason why is, well, and let me give you another, an example of this. You know, this goes back to, I can think about this in terms of architecture. Basically, ceramics are man-made rocks. That's all they are. They're essentially, they have the same properties, in some cases, identical properties. And so if you think about it, this goes back to architecture. One of the reasons why, maybe they didn't phrase it this way, but you know, the original build, like a lot of original buildings were built by what they called post and beam. And especially if you see like old Egyptian temples and things, they'd put up columns and then they'd put a beam of, of thing across the top and then it'd be another column and another beam across the top. What limited this kind of construction was the fact that when I have a, a, a piece of rock like this, and this is, and with the weight on it, this is trying to bend, right? It, it would like to sag in the middle. Well, if it would like to sag in the middle, that means the bottom is under tension and the top is under compression, right? Because when it's trying to do this, the top is sort of getting shorter and the bottom is trying to get longer, so the bottom is under tension. Ceramics and rocks are very weak in tension. And so if this gets long enough and the beam is heavy enough, what happens is a crack forms. And then the crack doesn't move slowly through the, it's not like a metal or a plastic that sort of tears, it just moves really quickly. So once the crack forms, it just goes right through the rock and it collapses. So this is what, this fundamental property of weak in tension is what limited this whole style of architecture. You couldn't make big heavy beams that were too long because the tension on the bottom was greater than the strength of the material and the beams would crack and collapse. But on the other hand, it allowed arch construction because in an arch, you put the materials, instead of having post and beam, you make an arch. And this, is, this is why this was such a clever development in architecture. Because now if I make an arch, everything is under compression.
These bricks are being, the weight and the way the arch is constructed, they're being pressed together at the joints. And, 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 and the weight is also going down like this, pressing on the ground. So the, all, the, all the bricks or the, the rocks in the arch are being pushed together. They're very strong under compression. So this arch can stand, unlike a post and beam, there's, there's a, if it's designed properly, there is no tension on the arch. It's all, each brick is pressing together and the whole arch is pressing down. Well, the materials are very strong in compression. So this is why this, this superseded post and beam construction for, for stone or, or rock, because this, this, now I'm taking advantage of the fact that they're strong in compression, exactly the same as our ceramics. So you say, well, you know, how do, we, how, do we, how do we run into this? This is the reason why when you load a kiln, you want to put posts over posts. Right, you've probably heard that when you load a kiln. Ideally, you'd like to put, what you'd like to do is you'd like to put a, you'd like to load a kiln. Like that, right? Whereas if you load it like this, Here's another post. What you're doing is you're putting additional weight in the middle of the shelf, and you're creating, you're trying to bend the shelf, and you're creating tension in the middle of the shelf, which is more likely going to crack the shelf. So this is the reason, the same reason, because ceramics are strong in compression. If I push down, and yeah, there are going to be some things on the shelf. There's, there's going to be some weight. But if all the weight of all the shelves above it is, is, is down through these columns. These are, these are very strong in compression. So I've got, I've got a weight of a little bit of pots, yeah, but I don't have the additional weight of all the shelves. That's why we want to, that's one of the reasons why we want to stack that way. Okay, if I follow that. The other thing this comes into play is even when you're cleaning the shelves. I don't know whether you've heard this, but you've heard the idea that when you, if you have a glaze drip on a shelf, when you chip the glaze drip off, you want to chip it toward the center of the shelf. So if I have a, let's say I have a half shelf and I have a glaze drip right here, I don't want to hit it that way, I want to hit it this way. And the reason is this. Here's the shelf looking sideways and here's my glaze drip. If I, if I have a chisel and I hit the glaze drip this way, I'm putting tension on the whole shelf. I'm tending to hit that, well again, I can, that's why I can knock that corner or that edge of the shelf off. Whereas if I hit it this way, I'm still going to flake the glaze off, but now I'm putting the glaze, the, the shelf under compression, and I won't knock the corner of the shelf off. That's the reason why we do it. Well, that's the reason why it's recommended. Maybe you don't do it, but you should. <laughs> okay. Again, because this is because strong in tension, strong in compression, weak in tension. And I've seen that happen a lot where it doesn't take much sometimes, especially, you know, if, the, if it's an old shelf, you just, with a chisel, you go bink, and, and the, the chip of glaze doesn't come off, the whole corner of the shelf comes off. The last couple, couple last things, just to wrap it up here. Um, the scratch resistance of, of fired ceramics, well, that's a, that's a fundamental physical problem. That's the hardness of the glaze. And that goes down to the strength of the atomic bonds in the glaze, basically, but a really fundamental physical property of just hardness. How hard is it compared to what, what's trying to scratch the glaze? Um, another, another property would, might be thermal shock resistance, like, like, you know, they make special kind, you make special kind of pottery or ceramics that you can put actually on a flame called flameware or oven that you can put on ovenware. That depends on properties like how easily heat is conducted, physical properties, how easily is heat conducted through the material. Ideally, if I'm going to change the temperature on something, remember it's going to expand when it gets hot, right? I would like that whole, that thing to get hot all over uniformly and quickly so that one part doesn't get hot faster than another, so that one part doesn't expand faster than another. So that's a fundamental property called thermal conductivity, meaning how fast is the heat conducted through the material. So for, for shock resistant parts, I want something with a high thermal conductivity. I want the heat to move through it quickly so that if, I, if one part, if the flame hit one part of it, the whole pot gets hot really fast. That's the ideal situation, okay? And the other part of, thermal, of this thermal shock resistance is the coefficient of expansion. I'd like a pot that doesn't expand a lot when it gets hot, so that if I have a pot that, that's not getting heated equally, one part isn't expanding a lot and cracking away from the other part. So if I have those two, if I have a low coefficient of expansion and a high conductivity, 
I can make things that just don't crack when you get them hot quickly. And you know what's a good example of that? Pyrex. That's what Pyrex glass is. They developed a glass composition that, that doesn't expand much at all when you heat it and cool it, but it conducts the heat pretty well, and so you can shock it and it doesn't crack. That's a special kind of glass that, that had those properties. And the last thing I wanted to talk about here is the ideal condition for, for a glaze, and you've probably heard of this, and, and this is why it works, is that ideally you'd like a glaze to be, you'd like the, I'm sorry, you'd like the clay to have a slightly high coefficient of, higher coefficient of expansion than the glaze. Okay, I'll repeat that. You would like the, the clay to have a slightly higher coefficient of expansion than the glaze. So that when the glaze is cooling, the clay contracts slightly more than the glaze, right? Everybody with me? So it, it puts the glaze in compression. It squeezes the glaze, right? Well, if it squeezes the glaze, that means it's gonna help resist because it's tension that's gonna crack the glaze. So if the glaze is being squeezed, I've got sort of a built-in margin of safety against something that's gonna to try to pull the glaze. So it actually strengthens the glaze. That's the ideal condition. So if a glaze is formulated properly and I have the glaze in, in slight squeeze by the clay, the pot is actually gonna be stronger than if it wasn't glazed at all. Because I've got that surface layer of glaze that's being compressed to resist anything that's trying to pull it in tension and crack it open, and it'll actually be stronger. Contrary to that, if I have little cracks in the surface like crazy, it's gonna be weaker because I've already essentially started a place for cracks to form. Okay? Okay, that's about all I had for, for, to wrap it up. Um, in terms of going through the, the whole process. So thank you all for coming, and I appreciate your coming out, especially on a crummy day like today. Thank you. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time, so if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. Well, we really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts. And if you'd like to help us, consider becoming a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable. We have five options, five different patronage levels that you could subscribe to. And we decided instead of naming them the typical gold, silver, bronze, platinum, we decided to give them clay names. So the first, the first level we have is, is what we're calling a clay patron, and that's for a dollar a month. And in, in exchange, you get recognition on our patron appreciation page in, our, in all of our videos. The second level that we have, we're calling a bisque level, which is um, $5 a month. And again, you get the recognition, plus you get a Potter's Roundtable sticker that you can put on your laptop or wherever you like, or on your forehead. Um, looks like this. Um, the third level that we have is called the earthenware level. That's $10 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get a transcript of any available episode that we have every month, a transcript of the, of the, of the presentations. The, the stoneware level is the next one. That's for $20 a month. You get all the previous benefits, plus you get one of our Potter's Roundtable t-shirts that looks like this. And the final level that we have is what we're calling the porcelain patron level, which is for $50 a month. And again, you get all the previous benefits. You also get a handmade by our by Dennis, our, our one of our founding members here, a handmade uh, pot, Potter's Roundtable mug. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.